focus on your breath. Each time you breathe in, each time you breathe out, remember to stay here. That's what mindfulness is all about, that ability to remember. You establish an intention in mind that you want the mind to settle down. And you don't want to forget that intention. Otherwise it doesn't bear fruit. This is one of the reasons why we sometimes use a meditation word with the breath. But in, to, uh, buto means awake. It's a quality we're trying to develop here. But the word itself isn't as important as the quality of mindfulness, just that ability to remember, to keep things in mind. This is where your refuge is. The Buddha talks about taking yourself as your refuge or making yourself an island for yourself. And he says you do that by developing mindfulness, right mindfulness. We have that reflection on aging, illness, and death to remind ourselves there are a lot of things that we can't depend on. But then there's reflection on karma. That's where our refuge is. Look at it and says we're owners of our actions, heir to our actions, whatever we do for good or for evil, to that we'll, we'll be full of heir. And you can focus either on the good or the evil. If you focus on the evil, karma is scary. A lot of things we do that are unskillful and they're going to bear results one way or another. And it's so easy to slip and forget. Another reason why you want to be mindful. But there's also the good side to karma. There's a lot of good you can develop with your actions. When the Buddha teaches karma, that's what he focuses on, is the good that can be done. This is why the reflection on karma is meant to give rise to confidence. That you have it within you that you can do this. If your habits are unskillful, you can change them. They're not written in stone. Past karma doesn't control everything. In fact, your primary experience is what your intentions are right now. When the Buddha analyzes the causes for suffering, he lines them up so that old karma, which is your experience of the senses, actually comes after your intentions. In other words, you approach the present moment with certain intentions, and then you'll find what you're looking for. If you don't find what you're looking for, you just keep looking until you get it. Which means that your present intentions have a lot of power. You want to make the most of that. You can bring an expectation of suffering into the present, or you can bring an expectation that there's a way out of suffering. It's your choice. And remember that you have that choice. And learn to develop it so that you're looking for the right things in the present moment that will maximize your ability to put an end to suffering. For example, when a panic attack comes, something in the mind triggers something in the body, and the hormones get released, and then your body's acting in a certain way, in a panicked way, even though the original panic is gone. It's just you've got the results left over, but it can take some time to get out of your system. Now you can read what's going on in the body as a sign that you're still panicking, or you can read it simply as, okay, that's the result of an action I took a few seconds ago, but I don't have to keep with that panic. That's using your ability to shape the present moment with your present intentions. I mean, you look at it in such a way that you're not going to be overwhelmed by the results of past actions. That's something you've got to keep in mind. So it is, it's so easy to slip in and read things the old way that you used to read them. But that old way was causing a lot of suffering. Do you want to keep with it, or do you want to change? There may be some appeal to that old way of reading things. But when you admit that the, the suffering there is not worth it, that's when you can Look for a new way. And this is what the teachings are for, is to give you some guidance on what the new, new ways of thinking are, so that you remember them. 
as the Buddha said, the whole of the holy life is having admirable friends. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to do the work for you. It does mean, though, that he's done a lot of the exploration for us, and he's taught us things that we can keep in mind. It's our ability to remember them. That's going to be our refuge, to remember them and to apply them. You know, the qualities of right mindfulness, not just mindfulness, the ability to remember, but also alertness, notice what's going on, and ardency, your desire to apply this knowledge in the most skillful way possible. So all of that together is going to be your refuge. So the teachings we got from the teachers are not there so that we can keep going back to the teacher again and again and again and hope that he's going to look after us. They're there to remind us, okay, this is what you do, and remember this, so that your memory becomes your teacher that you can go back to. You want to internalize those teachings. Years back, after John Fuang passed away, the first year after his passing was pretty rough in the monastery. A lot of people were jockeying for power one way or another, a lot of conflict. And it was during that period that a lot of his teachings kept coming to me about how to deal with conflict, how to deal with difficult situations. And this, my ability to remember those teachings that kept me going through that experience. So it was his teachings, but I had made them mine through my ability to remember them and to apply them. And that's what you've got to do with the teachings you gain from the Buddha and the noble, his noble disciples and from the great Ajahns, or wherever you get the lessons. Sometimes they're lessons you learn from your own actions. In fact, those are some, often the most important ones. You apply the teachings, and then you find that there are details that were not contained in the teachings, but they work for you. Okay, That's a lesson you want to remember. So it's your mindfulness combined with the alertness as to what's actually going on, and your ardency to shape things in the best way possible. That's going to be your refuge, and that will see you through. You've got to have the confidence that by acting on these qualities and developing them, you can form an island for yourself. And if the Buddha could could have taken us all to awaken, he would have done it. He was a compassionate person. The same with all the great Ajahns. But they realize it's something that requires skill, and each person has to develop skill for him or herself. You now the advice is there. The examples are there. You want to remember those and learn how to apply them so that you can make the most of this ability you have to shape the present moment with your present intentions. You want those intentions to be well informed. As the Buddha said there, shaped by our views and shaped by our respect or disrespect for the teachings of the noble ones. So if you have respect for those teachings, okay, you want to understand them as best you can. And you understand them through applying them. And you begin to realize okay, there are certain areas that you didn't understand them. It's the same as when you're learning a subject and you start teaching it, then you suddenly realize the areas that you didn't understand really fully because you can't explain them to other people. You've got to go back and do some more research on your own. In the same way, that there are times you've picked up some teachings and you apply them and they don't quite work. So part of the question is maybe the teachings weren't all that skillful, or maybe you just didn't understand them properly. You've got to check. Either way, it's your reading the situation and using ingenuity that will adjust things so that they really work. This is how you depend on yourself. You can lean on other people for a while, but they're allowing you to lean on them is so that you eventually learn what you need to so you can depend on yourself. So you can be that island in the midst of the flood. The flood waters rise, but the island is above the flood waters. That's how you provide yourself a place of safety. To honor that wish you have for, for true happiness. A happiness that doesn't harm anyone, and a happiness that isn't harmed by anything. To 
that's a wish that the Buddha has as honor, and he teaches us how to do it. But part of it means realizing that okay, there are dangers out there. If your happiness is based on trying to deny the dangers and the changes in the world, it's not based on truth. And if it's not based on truth, then it's going to get swept away. You want to happen is to be able to look at aging, illness, and death and not be phased by them. Because it's got something better, something that those things can't touch. That's where the real island is. And it's through developing these qualities of mindfulness, alertness, ardency. That's how we get to real safety.